Okay, welcome everybody. If we could uh, find a seat, if you're not seated, and we'll make a start. So, welcome to our LifeSpring Good Friday service. And um, we have uh, people here from our three churches across the region. And uh, other visitors, you are very, very welcome to be with us today. I'm going to set the scene uh, over, you know, the next two minutes. Uh, We felt some years ago there was a little bit of a gap. We went straight into Easter Sunday with wonderful celebrations of, of the resurrection of Christ. Whereas some, you know, traditional denominations and churches take things a little bit more paced and have other points in the week where they celebrate different aspects and think of different aspects of, of this um, particular time of the year where we think of the, the, um, the whole Christ event of his uh, trial and suffering and death and resurrection. So some years ago, we, we thought we'll do a Good Friday service. And uh, that's, that's what we're doing now. So I'm, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. It's not um, like we do it on a Sunday. We're going to have a series of contributions from different people around the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. In the Gospels, seven statements are recorded, um, words of Jesus from the cross. And Sun, you know, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, and we, we rejoice in the resurrection. But you know, there is a, a real, real value in just pausing to consider the sufferings of Christ, the price He paid, what He endured, the unique message of the gospel that God became flesh and dwelt among us and this is what he did so um, the only other thing I want to say is this look it's it's sobering but we're not morbid okay so please don't get religious on me okay we're not depressed we've not come here to uh, you know be morbid but we do want to enter in to this very, very special moment, okay? So I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to pray, hand over to the worship team, and then you will see the rhythm of the next hour. We'll get into that rhythm, and it's very special, and uh, we believe it will be meaningful to us all. So Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, and we're here to remember Jesus, not in a fluffy way, but in a sober way. And we pray that we might be helped by the Holy Spirit to understand and to enter into what He endured in His sufferings on the cross. Thank you, Lord. We we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Breaks the power of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. He shakes the whole earth with holy thunder. Who leaves his breath there is in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Who 
brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King above all kings Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be. reading is from Luke chapter 23 verse 32 two of the men both criminals were also led out with him to be executed when they came to the place called the skull they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right the other on his left Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And as, as I kind of read 
and meditated on, on this section of, of the passage that I've been given to share, there was three things that stood out to me. And the first of those is that Jesus was going through excruciating pain in this moment when he cried out to his father. The, the crucifixion and that, that way to be killed is, is gruesome, is painful, and is a humiliating way to be killed. And, and yet, in that moment of pain, he petitions to his Father in heaven and he petitions and says, forgive them, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And now the thing that really gets me with this is he's not just talking about the soldiers not knowing what they were doing, nailing his hands into that cross. He was saying, dad, forgive them, forgive us. It's you and me that put Jesus on the cross. It's our sin that put him there. And it just kind of touched me so much that he would cry out Jesus' love and his compassion and his compelling kindness towards us would cry out and plead to his Father in heaven, even in that pain, in that moment of pain. And he would petition for us. And it was our sin is the reason why he was there in the first place because that sin was separating us from our Father. And I just want to end by just praying this and for a moment. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness, for your compassion on us that you would petition on our behalf, that you would sacrifice yourself on our behalf. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Amen. Please stand.
I'm reading from Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong and he said Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom and he said to him truly I say to you today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, who had experienced suffering with an intensity we cannot comprehend, who went willingly to his torture to be crucified on a cross. Here is our precious Jesus being crucified with two thieves, one at his right, and one at his left. One of them hurled insults at Jesus. He criticized him severely and angrily mocked him for his personal failings. The thief taunted Jesus saying, save yourself and us. He mocked and rejected him. The other thief knew that they deserved to be punished, but also acknowledged that Jesus was different. He asked the first thief, do you not fear God? He knew Jesus. He had a personal encounter himself with Jesus. Jesus, who done nothing wrong. Jesus, who was sinless. Jesus, who was perfect. Yet he suffered for us here on the cross. 
for us. And then the thief humbles himself and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief puts his faith in Jesus. He gives Jesus his heart. And Jesus says, truly today, you will be with me in paradise. A promise. He was granted salvation and eternal life. God's extravagant love where Jesus was offering this man the gift of eternal life. How precious is the love of Jesus. Even when he'd been mocked, even when he was on the cross there, he still showed God's love and mercy. Many here have made this choice to love Jesus, to give Jesus our hearts. But the question is, are you like the thief who rejects Jesus? Or are you the one that's given Jesus your heart and know him as your Lord and Saviour? Lord and loving Jesus, I thank you that you've saved us. But for those that have not made that decision yet, it's not too late. Like that, that thief that was hanging there. Jesus, you can ask him to remember you when he enters into his kingdom and you'll have this gift of eternal life in paradise. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for going to the cross for us. Bless you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations, seem worthy is the Lamb who was saved. taken from John 19, verse 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. As Mary looked at Jesus on the cross, Jesus saw the agony that his mom was going through. Jesus knew that out of all those who looked up at him on the cross, none suffered like Mary. She saw him face pain, humiliation, shame, suffering, and soon to be death on the cross. Something that a parent would never want to witness. Truly a sword had pierced her soul. Not being able to physically comfort his mom must have added so much more to Jesus' pain. Maybe they both felt helpless. However, watching John, the only disciple present at Jesus' crucifixion, he showed genuine, genuine comfort and compassion towards Mary. And that gave Jesus a sense of peace, which led Jesus to say these words, Woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. Jesus' care for his mother to the end shows us that even on the cross, his attention was more on others and less on himself. If there was ever a time for him to be focused on himself, this would be the time, right? No. Jesus' focus remained on others and still does to this very day. Jesus was speaking to Mary, his mom, and John, his disciple. However, today, he's speaking to all of us, the body of Christ. And he's saying, just as I have instructed John and Mary to be mother and son, I implore you to do the same. Receive each other, love one another as brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, 
sons and daughters of this house and of my kingdom. We are family. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your care. We thank you that you showed us that you continue to care for us to this very day. We are family, we are one, and we belong to you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 27, verses 46 to 49. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, they said, this man's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and they offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will actually come and save him. Up until this point, Jesus referred to God as my father, not my God. He's crying out my God instead. That tells us something. It tells us the extreme degree of separation that came between God and his son at the time when the fullness of humanity's weight in sin fell upon him. You know, we've seen the pictures, a bloody Christ, a disfigured Christ. He felt forsaken, he felt separate, he felt abandoned. He became sin for us, say the scriptures. I think that back when he was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying um, and seeing this moment. I think when he said to the Lord, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me, this is what he was thinking, uh, the agony of being separate from his father. Yet he willingly endured it. I have to pace myself because I find this incredibly emotional. He did it for us, he did it for me. He endured it, and this is a love like there's no other, you know? He endured it despite it all and despite ourselves. Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 verse one and he cried out to God, but those who were pre present, you know, they didn't realize that. They thought this man's proper lost it, he needs a drink is in such pain that he's actually calling out to the prophet Elijah. They didn't realize the significance of that moment, yet they stood, they watched the tragedy, um, really just to see what's going what's gonna to happen, you know, with the exception of John and his mother, to see if the prophet would actually show up. Um, that happens today, you know, we look upon tragedy and we don't take action. And Jesus, there he was, standing, showing us, the love that God has for us, and people didn't notice. It's important that people notice that in us. There are four important lessons I take from this little bit of scripture as I've been meditating on it. One, Jesus deeply loves us. He's willingly endured in unimaginable suffering, like we've been saying all the way through every talk, and he endured separation from God in order to reconcile humanity to God. His cry reflects the magnitude of his love. Two, Jesus knows our suffering. His experience of, separ his, um, his experience of separation means he's, he knows what it's like to be an orphan. He knows what it's like to be lost, desperate, hurting. He knows what it's like to be lonely. He understands us when we're in those places and he helps us in our pain. Three, we can always trust in the word of God. Jesus at his most, uh, at his deepest point of pain, quoted scripture, quoted Dave, David in the Psalms. If that is good for Jesus, it's good for me. I can trust the word of God. I can rely upon God's ultimate purpose and plan as previous laid out for me in this book. And four, being reconciled to God was always the plan. 
despite that seeming abandonment of um, the son by the father, this was very important. Jesus needed to be separate, carry the weight of my sin in order for me to be reconciled back to God, to be in right standing with him, to be here singing of his praises, a testimony to his glory. Through Jesus' sacrificial death, his burial, and his resurrection, which will celebrate Sunday, every single person here can be offered a way to be made right with God. This emotion comes out of a place of hope, a life eternal, not only in his presence, but as his daughter, you know. All of us invited to be literally part of the family. It's huge and it's worth celebrating. Please could you stand so we can we can worship our God? Oh, 
John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said in fulfillment of the scripture, I thirst. Jesus knew death was very near and makes a declaration of thirst, which comes at the tail end of his sacrifice on the cross. These words were the last few words Jesus spoke. Words of a dying loved one are so precious, but what was Jesus referring to? Firstly, we understand his physical suffering, which Jesus suffered on our behalf. He had been mocked, beaten, crucified, and was depleted of all natural strength. Aside from his physical torment, in, this, in these words, we see scripture being fulfilled. The psalmist previously had spoken of suffering, forsakenness, loss of strength, and unquenchable thirst. We praise God, he had a plan, and the plan was being fulfilled. We recognize that though Satan meant his death for evil, God meant it for the good of the whole world. We serve an awesome, loving Father. In these words, we see Jesus continue to pour out selflessly his sacrificial love for us all. He was thinking of you, he was thinking of me, and our need for salvation, for someone to bear our curse and give us living water. Jesus became the curse so that we didn't have to. He made a way for the redemption of sin, amen. Please stand. All you are thirsty. Dip 
your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away In the waves of His mercy, O oh God As He cries out to Oh, we sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord. Take your seats. I'm going to read John 19, verse 30. It says, So when Jesus has received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus was born with a mission to save the people from their sins. And this was the moment where it all was affirmed and confirmed. Scripture talks about Jesus being given soured wine, and I just couldn't imagine the taste of a soured wine. I believe it's an unpleasant experience. But Jesus staying focused 
on his mission did not allow the physical experience to limit him from the victory. And sometimes we go through unpleasant situations that seem to rock the core and foundation of our faith. But what matters is what we look up to. Jesus did not allow his physical situation to rob him of the victory that he had. Instead, he declared, confirmed and affirmed, it is finished. And that is a word for us all as his children, declaring our salvation, our redemption, the completion of purchasing us by his blood that we've been bought with a price. It does not matter what experience unpleasantries, difficulties that we may face here on earth. The word it is finished means that your victory is guaranteed because it is finished. If Jesus says it is finished, who am I to think otherwise? Your salvation has been made and Paul calls us more than conquerors because we didn't have to fight the battle what a gospel herein lies the good news Jesus fought the battle he fought a good fight won the victory and has offered, his, offered us the victory it's for us to just receive that victory. Having received that victory, we ought to know that nothing, absolutely nothing, can change that victory. Because what is settled in heaven, what is settled in heaven, is settled eternally. Praise the Lord. Can we rise and worship our God? There was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory King of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on the cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the real was too What sacrifice was made as the heavens roll yeah. Oh, hail King Jesus Oh, hail the Lord of heaven and earth Oh, hail King Jesus 
A flash of light breaking through When all was lost he crossed eternity The King of Earth was on the moon In the dark cold Where our Lord has been What miraculous prayer And we forever change Oh, hail King Jesus to the final statement of Jesus on the cross, the final words of Jesus in the form of his human flesh. And I'm reading from Luke's gospel in chapter 23, verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and return. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. We could understand that death is not the cessation of existence. When we die, we don't cease to exist. Death is the separation of our mortal body from our spirit. 
Jesus' body died. But in his spirit, he went into Hades, not hell. Hell was created by God for the devil and his angels. That's the ultimate destination of Satan and those who reject Christ. Jesus went into the place of the dead. And there he went right up to the devil and he took the keys of death and hell. In other words, the the authority that, that Satan had had. He stripped death of its power. Because of the price that he'd paid. And then at his resurrection, God raised him from the dead with a new resurrection body. Now I, I want to I want to speak to every one of us in this room. When I look at Jesus and what he did on the cross, I find it very uncomfortable, very disturbing. I can't be complacent. I can't be smug and conceited or dismissive about what I see. Because It is a historical fact that Jesus experienced, suffered and endured what he did. The torture of the most brutal kind. The pain that we cannot imagine. The humiliation. And that's just the physical part of it. Because this this is the real thing. He took my sin. He did it for me and He did it for you. Not just the biggies, not the headline grabbing murders or cruelty. He did it for every little smug act of selfishness. My pride, jealousy, independence, hardness of heart, complacency, greed, lust. He did it for those little secret things as well as the big things. He did it for you and me. And I was 12 years old when that confronted me. I was just 12 years old, but I knew I needed a savior. I knew I couldn't ignore this Jesus. I couldn't walk away. I had to do something. And I did what Jesus did in that moment. Because in that moment, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It was a victory through surrender. Jesus won. He didn't come as a warlord. He didn't come on a horse with a sword. He didn't come with an army. He came and it's called a vicarious death. It was victory through suffering and surrender to his father's will. And that's what the devil didn't understand till it actually happened. But now every one of us, we have to make that choice. What will I do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Because one day, we will all stand before him and he will say, what did you do with my son? And we have to have our own act of reconciliation where we say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I personally commit my life to you. Not just my body, but that eternal part of me. I commit my spirit to you. I turn away from my life of of self-living, even religious self-living, because outside of Christ, even my religious acts are just filthy rags. They're a poor substitute because there's nothing I can do to bridge that gap between me and God. Only Jesus could do that. And therefore our salvation is trusting in Him. 
and saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. So right now we're going to take communion and you should have a little uh, cup with the emblems there. Now I want to explain what we're going to do because this, this needs to be real. If you don't have one, pop your hand up and we'll make sure you have one. Mercy, could you pass mine to me because I left mine on my chair. Thank you. Whoops. I can't grab it. It's alive. Now, if you're a guest here and you, you're not a Christian or you're not sure, we are, we, it's really okay, all right? There is no compulsion. We're not forcing you into something that you don't feel comfortable with and we're not going to put the spotlight on you. Please relax and it's absolutely fine. If you're a believer, then we're going to invite you to participate in this together. But here's the thing. I want to address those of you that maybe you've heard and seen everything tonight and you haven't made that decision for yourself. You haven't yet said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, my heart, my life. And I, in this moment, I turn away from my self-life. I thank you, Jesus, that you did this for me. And now I commit my life to you. And I just want to give you an opportunity to pray right now. So before we break bread and take the wine, please close your eyes and forget that there's anyone else in the room. In your mind, think about that cross. Think about the Son of God, the, the, the only one who shouldn't have died, did it for me. The innocent one for the guilty, he did that for me. And if you would like to give your life to Christ, then pray this prayer after me, just line by line. Just repeat this prayer as I did as a 12-year-old to receive Jesus personally as your Savior in your own heart. I'm not going to ask you to do it like out loud, but say the words just the same. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place, to take my sin. And now I come to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for doing that for me. I turn from my old life. I turn from my sin and I say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, my life, my future. I take Jesus as my Savior. In his wonderful name, amen. Amen. If you did pray that prayer, we would love to know. And at the end, in a few moments, we'd like to uh, pray with you and give you a little booklet uh, about the Easter message. But right now, can we stand together? And um, we're going to take the little element. If you peel the top layer off, you get this little token of bread. And this is what I want us to do because we're family and because we're together. Jesus' body was broken. I want, I want you to break that. Break that thing. And you have two pieces. And then, just for a minute, we're going to turn to each other. And I want you to go to two people and share, break bread, exchange. And if you gave your life to Jesus just now, you can do this for the first time as a believer. And you can truly say, thank you, Lord, that your, your body was broken for me. And as you share, just say, this is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Okay, so we're just going to have a little bit of holy confusion and just be blessed. Just turn to one another. Bless somebody with, with the bread. Amen. Just for one minute.
the body of Christ that was broken for you. The body of Christ that was broken for you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now you may take the cup and we'll drink it together. So if you can manage to open that lid without spilling it all over your white shirt, as I have done in the past. Um, and just take that cup. I'm going to say one statement, then we'll drink together. Lord Jesus, thank you. This is your blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Please remain standing.
nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. The cross, the cross as the final word. The cross as the final word. Sorrow. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has the final word. Amen. Please remain standing for a moment. First of all, I want to thank our amazing team for, for doing such a great job. It really, it really has been done with such excellence and sensitivity. Thank you for the tech team, for the worship team, and for the people who contributed to those meditations. And honestly, I was, I was personally so blessed trying to keep back the tears down there, you know. It was just so moving, every one of you. Thank you so much. You did such a great, great job. We really appreciate that. Thank you all for coming. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday in the city center, 1.30, there is a united celebration for churches across Wolverhampton. I want to invite you to come to that in Queen Square. Sunday, if you don't have a place of worship, we will be here. 10 a.m. Uh, with a shout of victory. Amen and rejoicing. So as we finish now, if you want a copy of this booklet, please come down. I will be here at the front. I would love to give you a copy. I'd love to bless you. And especially if you prayed that prayer for the first time to ask Jesus into your life, I'd love to meet you and, uh, and bless you. So let's pray and then we'll finish. Father, we want to thank you for an absolutely wonderful time. Jesus, we want to thank you because this has been all about you and the cross that has the final word. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for applying these amazing truths to our hearts and lives. And we give you the praise and the honor. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Be blessed. Thank you.